The title of my presentation is On-Farm Irrigation. How to use soil information to decide when and how much to irrigate. And I want to give you an update on our variable rate irrigation research. The structure of my presentation is first, I want to give you a brief background. Then we want to learn about soil water relationships and how we can use them for irrigation decisions. And I will end this presentation with an update on our variable rate irrigation research. And then later I am prepared during our round table or discussion session to have further talking points on mapping of soils and delineation of management zones for variable rate irrigation and computer simulation of plant and soil processes. So simple facts on the irrigation control that we want to hear about this morning. When do we turn on irrigation? How much water do we apply? And when do we turn it off? There are simple rules that I would like to share with you today that may help you to uh, make irrigation decisions. Most of our research happens in this field. It's the Hargis field in Trevor Gilkey's Hillview Farms in Princeton, Kentucky. And this field is classified as a Crider silt loam for most part. But uh, you can see from the topographic elevation map of this field that we have quite a variation uh, in topography. We have um, shoulders, we have back slopes and foot slopes. And with that comes a significant spatial variability of soil properties. This spatial variability is mostly caused by our typical cast landscape uh, topography, which is typical for wide zones in the Mississippi Delta watershed. And many of you know these kinds of phenomena in your own fields. Uh, we have depressions in sinkholes where the good soil accumulates. The soil development in this field has left us with the following situation. We have a large area of this about 150 acre field that has clay contents between 15 and 20% which is good. So these are the fertile zones in this field. And then on the other hand, we have also zones with clay contents between 25 and even more than 30%, which cause problems. You know that in such a silty area, water can infiltrate better than in these clay zones. And they are especially in back slopes. So we have to deal with a lot of water runoff. I've done some computer simulations here. Let's assume a situation where we apply 7 tenths of an inch. Here I have the time axis a few minutes after begin of irrigation. This is a typical time it takes the pivot to pass over one point. And in the low clay content soil, all the water can infiltrate. However, in the slopey area, in the back slope with high clay content soils, soon after the onset of irrigation, water is running off because the infiltration capacity has already been exhausted and no more water can infiltrate and we have cumulative water runoff. The, the problem is not the 7 tenth of an inch, as you can imagine. 7 tenths of an inch applied over a whole day is a million dollar rain, but seven tenths, seven tenths of an inch applied in 12 to 15 minutes causes really a problem because the intensity is then 84 inches per day. And that is more than a millennium rainstorm. We now want to go into soil water relationships. Many of you have probably heard or you know what the soil, what one very important soil water characteristic is, the so-called soil water retention curve or water release characteristic. We see on the 
x-axis, the energy status of soil water, the soil water suction. You measure suction values, for example, with tensiometers or with watermark meters. And on the y-axis, we have volumetric soil water content. So in cubic inch per cubic inch or simply volume per volume units. And we can see here, I've plotted this for three different soil types from the literature for a silt loam, a clay loam and a soil uh, and a sand soil, uh, how the relationship between soil water content and energy status uh, looks like. For the silt loam, the green line and for the red, uh, for the clay loam, the red line. So how tight is water held by the soil? We can read that simply from this diagram. So if we have a volumetric water content of let's say 0.3, then we can tell that the energy is 20 kilopascal. So the, the water is held back in the soil with 20 kilopascal or the root would have to execute 20 kilopascal in order to extract water from the soil. The drier the soil gets, the tighter is the water bound in the soil because the pores get smaller and smaller and the plant has to execute more and more energy. And if energy has to be applied, a lot of energy has to be applied, that comes for a price. That's the price of yield depressions. How much plant available water is in the soil? We have two limits for plant available water. The upper limit is the field capacity, which is in our soils about 10 kilopascals of suction. And the lower limit is the permanent wilting point. So we cannot say that at permanent wilting point that the soil is absolutely dry, but all the water that is left in the soil is dead water because it is not accessible for plants anymore. Plants can apply for a maximum of 1500 kilopascal of suction. And if the water is held tighter, then the plants die, they wilt irreversibly. The upper limit or the field capacity characterizes all the water in the soil that can be held in soil pores against gravity. For the silt loam soil, we have a limit here of plant available water between about 0.33 and 0.1 volume per volume leaving us with a plant available water capacity of 0.23. For the clay loam soil, the field capacity value is about 0.33, but the amount of water at the permanent wilting point is 0.15. And that means we have only 0.18 volume per volume units of plant available water. For the sandy soil, it is even smaller. I will not talk about sand uh, right now for time reasons. When do I need to turn on irrigation? We will stress this point during this presentation a lot. We, want, we do not want for sure to wait until the soil is down to permanent wilting point and then turn on the irrigation. That would cause a lot of stress to the plant to extract the water and that's what we want to avoid. So by experience, we say, if this is the entire range of plant available water, so for the silt loam 0.23, and for the clay loam 0.18, we do not want to let this more deplete than 60%. So down to 60%. That means we get for the silt loam to about this pressure head value or suction value of roughly 33. And for the clay loam, we get to a little drier tension. We will look at those numbers in one of the following slides. How do we avoid over-irrigation? Well, 
if the soil is already very wet, we don't want to make it wetter and let it come above field capacity because once the water gets into this range, then it is lost through deep drainage and it takes with it nutrients. Next, we want to look into some numbers here for the same soil, silt loam, clay loam and sand. Again, the field capacity values, the same for silt loam and clay loam. And for the permanent wilting point, that's 0 0.1 and 0 0.15 for both soils, leaving us with a plant available water capacity. So the maximum storable plant available water content, this one minus that one with 0.23 or 0 0.18 for the clay loam or 0 0.04 for the sandy soil. Now, in terms of soil water storage, what does that mean? So in terms of soil water storage for a four inch layer, four, we multiply the depth range four inch with the plant available water content and then end up with this plant available water storage. The maximum amount that can be stored plant available as plant available water in a four inch layer, leaving us for the silt loam with 0.9, the clay loam 0.7 and for the sand with less than 0.2 inches. For a one foot layer, like the A horizon in a soil, we almost store three inches of plant available water in a silt loam and in a clay loam, two inches and in a sand, half an inch. For an entire three foot depth profile, we have more than eight inches of plant available water storage in the sil silt loam, six and a half inches of plant available water in a clay loam and one and a half inches in a sandy soil. So here we want to look again at, at how much plant available water is in the soil, but now we do not look at the maximum capacity, but we look at actual at an actual situation characterized by water content or water potential measurements. First, let's look here at the reading of a suction water suction in an upper compartment between four and 12 inches, the measurement depth is eight inches. We have 75 kilopascal in the 16 inch layer representing the range between 12 and 20 inches. We have 55 kilopascal in the, in the 24 inch depth representing 20 to 28 inches. We have 30 kilopascal and all this for a silt loam soil this corresponds to a soil water content that we can easily transfer these readings back and forth with a water retention curve, 0 0.19, 0 0.2 and 0 0.25 volume percent of water. The soil water content at permanent wilting point, so the dead water that is included here, but it's not available is 0 0.1. So we have actually only a plant available water content of 0 0.09, 0 0.11 and 0 0.15. We came to these numbers by just subtracting the 0 0.1 from each of these three numbers. If we multiply this with the depth range of the 24 inch profile here in this case, we end up with 2.8 inches of plant available water storage. Now compared to the maximum plant available water capacity in a 24 inch depth zone, we have 5.5 inches of plant available water storage. So 2.8 compared to 5.5 is only 51%. Remember I told you at 60% we need to turn on the irrigation so it is already too dry and irrigation should have turned on latest 9% ago already. So these irrigation limits, I want to characterize them one more time here. When do I turn on the irrigation? So given our 
limits of field capacity and permanent wilting point and the plant available water capacity, 60% of depleted plant available water capacity, we end up with a water content with a plant available water content of 0.14 in a silt loam, 0.11 in a clay loam, and 0.02 in a sandy soil. This represents 60% of deplete, 60% uh, plant available water, so 40% depletion in the silt loam and clay loam. And for the sandy soil, we can go down to 50%. And these 60, 60, 50 refer to 24 or a water content of 0 0.24, 24 volume percent in the silt loam. In the clay loam, it is 0 0.26, and in the sandy soil, 0 0.07. Or if you use tensiometers or metric potential sensors, 33 kilopascal, 40, and 21 for the three uh, soil types. Another reason for turning on the irrigation not too late is this characteristic, which is related to the soil water retention curve. This is the hydraulic conductivity function. And notice, please, both axes are nonlinear. So this is a highly nonlinear function. And we can tell that between saturation, where we have 10 inches per day hydraulic conductivity, and the irrigation limit, so 60% depletion when we want to turn on the irrigation, we have already a loss of hydraulic conductivity by a factor of 1000. So if the soil gets still drier, then it gets harder and harder to turn on the irrigation and to allow the water infiltrating into the soil. We do not get this, the water anymore where we want it. And that causes irreversible yield depressions. So turning on not too late is a very important rule. How do we avoid over irrigation? Well, we need to stay away from the water content or soil water suction range above field capacity. So if the soil is already very wet, let's say at minus, uh, at, uh, at 30 kilopascal, uh, we may irrigate a little, but never get above 10 kilopascal because that would then mean uh, water loss. How do we know field capacity? Well, we can either look it up in, a tech, uh, in, a, in the literature or on a website, or you can use your soil moisture sensors if you have them out there over winter. And at the end of winter, we observe a long rainfall period. And at the end of that rainfall period, you wait for two more days, and then you take a reading with your sensors. And if that reading is stable for several hours, so the soil water does not, the soil water content or suction do not change significantly, then that is a, a, an arbitrary estimate of the field capacity. It is a very rough estimate, but better than nothing. Now we want to look into a profile application of plant available water and plant water depletion. In this case, we look at a scenario with a fully developed root system. So we have a silt loam on top of a clay loam in both scenarios. And the scenario one is a wet condition. And later we look at a drier condition in scenario two. We have soil water content measurements at four different depths representing these ranges. So the measurement depth is 4.5, 13.5, and so on. And two sensors stick in the silt loam and two in the clay loam. Given these measurements and given the permanent wilting point, again, we do the same thing as in the previous table. We subtract this value from the permanent wilting point and end up with a plant available soil water content. 
you know, all the four measurement layers here and multiply it with the depth range of nine inches. So we get the soil plant available water storage and integrate that over depth. And we have a total water storage of 5.4 inches, which compared to the entire profile, uh, plant available water capacity is 73%. So irrigation would not be necessary yet because we are still 13% above the threshold. Now let's look to the drier scenario. For example, we are here in a different year like 2012. Again, the same limits here, permanent wilting point, but now we have much lower plant available water content, these values minus these limits for their respective depth ranges, leave us with a plant available water storage. And that is integrated up to less than three inches of water. Three inches of water compared to the total plant available water storage capacity in the soil is only 40%. So irrigation should have been initiated long time ago. To give you a little impression of water storage compared to transpiration at this time of the year when we have a fully developed root system and a fully developed corn canopy, the, the evapotranspiration rate is slightly less than a quarter of an inch per day, mostly 0.4 to 0.5 inches per day on some hot and windy days, even more than that. Now we want to look at a scenario for a Crida silt loam soil where we do not have a completely developed root system, but a corn crop that is during growth. So for that, I have prepared a little um, scenario that I want to initiate now. So here you can see a little calculator uh, that we are currently developing. So let me show you the, first of all, this uh, graph, we have the soil water profile and the soil water profile depth is, let's say 50 inches. That's the maximum root, uh, 40 inches is the maximum rooting depth of the corn. Our fixed limits here are field capacity, which is the blue line. This is the soil water content in a two layer soil profile, upper part silt loam, lower part clay loam. And this water content at field capacity is the water content that can be held back by pores against gravity. On the other end, we have the permanent wilting point. And clearly you can see now the permanent wilting point is at a lower water content in the silt loam layer part of the profile. And here in the deeper layers, we have clay loam. And here, the permanent wilting point is already higher. This difference between field capacity taken 60% of that difference is denoted by the green line. So this green line is the theoretical depletion limit Whenever the soil water gets below that limit, we need to turn on the irrigation unless roots can take up water from a different layer. So here we begin here with the same scenario that I showed you in the previous table in the PowerPoint. So a wet situation. And let's assume the farmer planted corn on April 15, which was actually the case. And the current date uh, for which we entered these soil water content values at the four measurement depth, that date was May 15. So a month after planting the corn and we have a root depth already down, reaching down to 12.7 inches. And the root zone here is slightly deeper because we have capillary rise of water. That's why I characterized the root zone as the effective root zone. We can tell 
that to some depth, the measurements denoted by the black line here, the, the measurements are already below the 60% depletion limit. And we say, and this zone is ends at eight inches. So the calculator has given that number to us and tells us there's a deficit situation down to eight inches soil depth. That is characterized by this part. We then have some part of the profile where the measured water content is still above the deepest rooting depth. So the roots take up now mostly from this part here. And uh, um, that is why, the, why there is no absolute stress situation right now. But the calculator tells us if we think about irrigation and want to avoid going above field capacity, then the calculator tells us the root zone. So this root zone at the moment can store an additional 1.5 inches of water. And right now the total water deficit in the root zone, that is the, uh, the water deficit here in this part, and then we have still excessive water above that 60% depletion limit here, this area in the root zone, both areas added up shows us a water deficit of 0.25 inches. Now we want to look at the second scenario, so a drier condition, and I simply copy the numbers and enter them as measurements now into this table here. And here we are. So now the measurements went down. Of course, the field capacity and permanent wilting point, they stayed the same. The root depth stayed the same. And now we have really a more serious deficit situation because the entire rooting depth is depleted far down below the 60% depletion limit. So uh, with the same calculated rooting depth of 12.7 inches, we have a deficit situation now down to 18 inches of uh, soil depth. So 18 inches is depth where the soil water content is below the depletion limit. The root zone could easily store, so this part of the profile up here could easily store 2.9 inches more water before it would, before it would uh, reach field capacity. And the root zone has a, a water deficit of minus 1.65 inches. That is this part, this part of the area. We can also simulate now a case. Um, what if we had measured these sometime later, let's say a month later, and we now consider the effect of a greater rooting depth. And we get here to this point, and now we can analyze the situation in the same fashion. So this tool is currently in development, and now I will go back to the PowerPoint uh, slides and want to give you a brief overview over our upgrading of the pivot system. So it is an about 1,100 feet radius pivot, a circular pivot and uh, um, valley irrigation systems came in and they, uh, they upgraded this pivot system. Uh, Jeff Franklin at Katie Pratt made a nice video. Here's a link to that video. And each of these uh, sprinklers were exchanged. So they received uh, uh, shut off valves and regulating valves that were connected through water hose and electric. Uh, line and uh, uh, of course we also got a new panel and the work that we need to do now is that we learn the tools it's a lot of geographic information system that we create a variable rate application map and in the research that we want to start this spring is we want to find out how precise how exactly can we control the water application and 
how much of the applied water through a, through one nozzle, nozzle do we recover in the rain gauge on the soil surface and also in the soil. And in the soil, we keep monitoring the soil water content at different depths down to uh, three foot depths. We, want, we are interested in variable rate irrigation effects on crop yield, but also environmental stewardship. So at the deepest rooting or at the lower end of the rooting depth, we install tensiometers and a suction probe and take soil solution and then want to find out do we have upward directed water movement into the root zone from below or downward directed water movement and uh, how well can we control that with variable rate irrigation and therefore serve the environment by reducing nitrate losses. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation and want to hear in the discussion in the following discussion or later in the round table from you, what is important for you to find out about variable rate irrigation and what knowledge support do you as growers expect from us UK researchers uh, that helps you with your irrigation decisions. I want to acknowledge Trevor Gilkey, the owner of Hillview Farms for letting us do this research in his uh, farm and my former graduate students, Javier Reis, Shi Zhang and our technicians, Mr. Wharton and Dollarhide, our department, college and the UK Grain and Forage Center. And I would also like to thank the soybean board, the Southern Soybean Research Program, the Kentucky Corn Growers Association, Small Grain Growers Association, Zima Milling, and the Kentucky Farm Bureau. And with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and look forward to uh, your comments now in the discussion.